This week on Oklahoma Horizon. Well, as children head back to school this fall, some are staying home. We begin today with a look at the growth in homeschooling around the state and across the nation. Real homeschooling looks nothing like public school. I mean, it looks just, it, there's no comparison because it's, they're two different paradigms. We'll meet some homeschool students taking advantage of new biomed and pre-engineering classes at their local technology centers. And we tag along as some homeschoolers compete in a national robotics competition. Plus, we look at this summer's drought and the impact it could have on your dinner table. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Well, according to the most recent federal estimates, the number of homeschool children in the U.S. has nearly doubled between 1999 and 2007 to nearly 1.5 million students. And as more families opt out of conventional schools, they are doing it for a variety of reasons. Joining me now is our Andy Barth with his perspective on this growing trend. Rob, Oklahoma is the only state with a constitutional provision guaranteeing the right to homeschool. And with more than 25,000 homeschool students statewide, we are seeing a growing amount of parents and students taking advantage of the opportunity to learn at home. From every appearance, students here are like those everywhere. Some loud, others quiet. Most just happy to be with friends. But what sets these young people apart is when their friends head off to school, they stay home. Real homeschooling looks nothing like public school. I mean, it looks just, it, there's no comparison because it's, they're two different paradigms. Jerry Christman is the president of the Oklahoma Homeschooling Organization and says this convention is an education in itself. There are different uh, vendors here with different uh, curriculums to meet your kids' needs. That way you can individualize their education. But rather than teachers going from booth to booth, here it is the parents that take the lead with their child's education. It's a place where the, you can actually come and talk to the authors, you can talk to the reps, where if you just look online and order online, you don't get any personal interaction. You don't get to ask and feel and touch and just see if this is right for your kids or if this is right for you as a parent. Since 1999, Homeschooling has grown from 850,000 students to more than 2 million, mirroring a national trend where 1 in 27 students call home school. A growing trend. Take it from a homeschooler from the state of Washington. It's a decision my husband and I have never regretted. Meet Lisa Barth, my mom and teacher. For the past 11 years, she taught me my sister and brother, everything from English to social studies. But not everything a young person needs to know can be found at home. My youngest participated in football for two years, um, his junior and senior year, and that was very rewarding. He was actually elected captain his senior year. My daughter played basketball, um, and she enjoyed that. Which is what brings us here. As 3,000 FFA members come to Pullman, Washington to attend the annual state FFA convention, not many homeschool students will be found. But for people like my family, FFA and agricultural education was an obvious addition to our homeschool curriculum. Each May, FFA members from around the state come to the Washington State University campus to compete in leadership and team competitions. My sister and I grew up in FFA, and this year, our little brother competed for the final time. I, I had the easier life because I, I was able to go into one class or two classes, and then I was able to go home and take care of you know my schoolwork. And, and I think, actually, homeschooling for me, I think, was the best 
but was the best way to go. Um, and the reason being for that is because I was heavily involved with, with our livestock company and producing the, the club lambs and show hogs and being able to direct enough attention to that. Uh, but then also, I, I think the main reason why homeschooling was the best way for me to go was the auction career. Um, I mean, obviously, and then I, I want to continue my education at a collegiate level, but I'm in a position now to where if I absolutely needed to, I can go to work and, and support myself and then, I mean, be able to build up and then eventually support a family. And as for the socially awkward stereotype, I'm very shy. I, no. Jacob was elected as the vice president of the Washington State FFA Association for the coming year, a task no shy person can take on. Sure, yeah, there are shy homeschoolers, absolutely, who don't have social skills. But, I mean, I, I see kids like that in public school every day. I, I think the people who criticize homeschooling, they just see one situation or one example, and then they just, I guess, profile the entire system itself. And you know, I, I think we as a society do that with a lot of uh, a lot of different examples. Homeschooling helped each of us in different ways. My sister Christine found the independence of homeschooling rewarding, particularly after graduating high school. Some of the benefits that I think I gained from being homeschooled was I learned to work independently um, and be self-motivated. I did notice that. Putting in a lot of time at home outside of the classroom in college wasn't something that was really hard for me to comprehend. Um, the idea of studying for a couple hours was something that, that I was used to doing at home and so that was okay and I think that that's something that's really, really required um, to be able to excel in college. Back in Oklahoma, we caught up with the Pierce family who we met at the homeschool convention and spent the day getting an inside look at the life of a homeschooler. I would say they've been more excited this year than probably any other year that they're happy with the curriculum. Straight. Darla Pierce is Brady and Olivia's mother and says homeschooling isn't always easy. I think probably the biggest struggle is, you know, some people say, I could never homeschool. It's not the schooling that's hard, it's dealing with children and their different personalities and their different events on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm the biggest eighth grader here. You know, I'm learning as they're learning. Barry Pierce is the children's dad and says he learns just as much as his kids. I took her for a, a roping lesson over at a friend of mine's house is teaching her how to rope. She wants to be a steer roper. That's something that even though I'm not capable of teaching her physically, I can go and find somebody that is instead of just leaving her there for two hours like people will with their kids at Little League. I stay there with her and I learn with her. It's for me to learn. Life at the Pierce household isn't all book work. After the classroom part is over, Brady and Olivia help out with ranch chores. The love for horses isn't the only admiration around the ranch. Brady Pierce bought a truck with his own money and is fixing it up before he turns 16. After I bought it, I did some stuff to it and it had almost brand new tires and wheels and everything. And I put uh, a new air filter in it, I put new spark plugs, new batteries, and new belts, and um, I put a headache rack and toolbox and stuff on it, and new windshield wipers. And I still have a lot of stuff to do it, do to it so it'll run better and look better. But Brady doesn't only love his truck. Homeschool ranks high on his list of favorites. I like it and I learn a lot and I know if I went to public school, I wouldn't uh, learn as much or get taught. I would be doing, hanging out with bad people and I, at uh, doing homeschool I can hang out with good people and read the Bible and pray. And while there are as many different reasons people homeschool as there are students, it is a path that more and more families are starting to take. So Andy, let's talk details. Are homeschool students, are they required to take the same test that public school students do 
to progress from one grade to the next. Actually, Rob, homeschool students in Oklahoma aren't required to take standardized tests. However, their parents will oftentimes t have them take annual tests just to make sure they're keeping up with their peers. Now, what about the parents, these parent teachers? Do they require special certification? They don't. However, many parents will go to support groups or take some special classes just to make sure they're comfortable in that teaching role. What about college? How does a homeschooler get admitted into college? Rob, homeschool students can go to college just like any other student. Oftentimes they'll take the SAT or the ACT like any other high school student, or sometimes they'll just take the college placement exam. But whether you are a homeschool student, a private school student, or a public school student, um, it's best to contact the college university you're interested in going to and finding out their guidelines and restrictions before even applying. Certainly. Now, you, you mentioned those three. I understand that you have been both a private school student, a public school student, and a homeschool student. What do you tell people from your perspective? I had the best of all the opportunities. Um, I enjoyed going to public school. I had some amazing opportunities, some wonderful teachers that really shaped my life. And then when I decided, my family and I decided to go the homeschool route, um, I had some wonderful educational opportunities, both through the curriculum that the state required and through the curriculum that my family, uh, whether it was um, going on my, on my grandpa's truck in the auction business or working with my dad in his noxious weed spraying business or in our livestock operation. You know, there's book work that you have to take, but then there's those life lessons that you really get to learn in business as yeah, well. Yeah, real, real life experience. And let me ask you this, how important were the extracurricular activities that you took in conjunction with the public schools? They were extremely vital. As I mentioned in this package and in previous episodes that we've done here on the show, I was extremely involved in FFA and that really shaped my life as well as my siblings' lives. And in order to be in FFA, you have to take ag classes in the public school system. So in conjunction with my homeschool curriculum, I attended ag classes at our high school. And my agricultural education instructor was an amazing individual, a wonderful educator, and he really made an impact on my life and was actually a groomsman in my wedding. And um, so I would take my homeschool studies along with me to the high school, I would attend my ag classes, would go to the public library after school and just do my homeschool studies there while waiting on another ag class. And when all that was said and done, would go home, finish out my studies, and would work on my livestock projects after that. Final question for you. If you ever have kids, would you consider homeschooling them? The biggest answer to that whenever I get answered, asked that question was, it will be, it depends. Um, kids are obviously a little ways down the road right now, but um, I had amazing experiences in public and homeschooling, all my educational opportunities, and right now my wife is studying to be an agricultural educator. So she, we are going to be involved in the public school system for a very long time. Um, a lot of times, people only remember the bad teachers, and that's unfortunate because there's a lot of people who dedicate their lives to changing um, students' lives and making a huge impact on their education. And so hopefully we can find a school that has some amazing teachers that we can put our kids in, um, but we will eventually make that decision, and when the time comes, further down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I heard further down the road. Well, certainly an interesting subject matter, and one I really appreciate your perspective on. Thanks, Rob. All right. Now when we return, we're going to take a look at how some homeschoolers are taking advantage of new technology classes. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, while homeschooling can be beneficial for some students, parents do face a dilemma. Individually, they simply do not have the same financial resources a large school district does. But there is a solution a growing number of homeschool families are taking advantage of, which is where our Lisa Hines picks up the story. Currently, close to 400 homeschool students attend any one of the 57 career tech campuses around the state. We caught up with a couple of these students taking advantage of the high tech offerings at their local technology center. These shapes were uh, shapes that we created ourselves. For homeschooler Jacob Pierce, the Pre-Engineering Academy at Francis Tuttle Tech Center provides him with an opportunity to do what he loves. I initially started out pre-engineering because uh, I heard the math and science here. And uh, I'm, I, I like math, um, and so I, I initially that's why I started out. But as I got to doing it, I found it actually, it took math and science and put life applications to it where you could actually go into a career where you use those every day. Learning skills in a positive atmosphere. I really like it because you're around other people who are raised on a higher level um, of education who want to actually go beyond just what you get normally from high school or what I'd get normally at a homeschool. You get to take AP classes. One thing I like here is the teachers here. 
they come before school, after school, stay during their lunch breaks, and they're, they're able to help you if you have problems. And uh, they all have engineering backgrounds. Uh, it's not just a teacher who got an education degree and wants to try to figure out what engineering is to teach you, but they actually have been engineers so they know what that is. Across town, fellow homeschooler Abigail Jebaraj says Francis Tuttle's Biomed Academy was a turning point for her. I actually found out about the academy going to a homeschool convention. They had a table set up there with pre-engineering and medicine, so I got to go there and l learn a little bit about the academies. That was when my hard choice had to happen, whether I was going to go into engineering or medicine. And Abigail chose medicine. I would say it's definitely more specialized because this academy is for pre-med students. We're all very focused. We're all, since we had to apply and be interviewed, we're all the best of the best. So we all want to be here. We all want to do our best in that we all encourage each other in order to pursue a career in medicine. An education that for both is taking them to college. I'm planning on going to Oklahoma State University and uh, double majoring in aerospace and mechanical engineering. I plan to go to the University of Oklahoma in the fall. And I will be in the Medical Humanities Scholars Program, which is a selective program for students interested in, in the medicine field. This academy has really prepared me for college, I believe. Being able to go into interviews, being confident, talking about what I know scientifically, mathematically, and also uh, professionally. Putting these homeschool students on a pathway to success. Now for all high school students, including the homeschool students, to attend any one of the career techs, it will cost them zero dollars. Now some homeschool students are using their local tech centers for more than just class. They're actually learning to build functioning robots. And at this year's state robotics competition, a group of homeschool students qualified to compete at the world competition in St. Louis. So we gave them a camera and here's what they brought back. It's a basketball game unlike any other. The players, student built robots from a team of Oklahoma homeschool students. This is a very unique team because obviously most of the students and our, our homeschool kids. Learning at home, but competing against students from some of the best science and math schools in the country. My name is Kermit Alexander, the second, uh, 15 years old, ninth grade. This is my third year robot. Well, it's fun because I like programming and uh, Program with robots gives a lot of different challenges over program with a PC. There's a lot of different things that you do have to think about compared to when you're programming with a PC. You see a lot of different interesting challenges and constraints when you're programming a robot. Stepping outside their books to stand behind a robot is exactly what these homeschool students have done. We're kind of unusual compared to most of the teams around here. We're associated with 4-H. 4-H is wanting to get out of the stereotype of being plows and cows and sows. They're wanting to get into the, into the uh, city. And, uh, and get into science, technology, engineering, and math. And by all indication, they're there. As first thing I have for a lot of strategy about how you want the, pro the uh, robot to work in hospital in general. Then the basic what you have to do next is translate that to the programming language you're using. It's not that hard, but most of the problems are from that translation step. That's pretty much all there is to it. Sounds easy, right? My name is Bryce Gifford. I'm nice. <laughs> I'm in the ninth grade, I'm 15 years old, and I've done robots for, this is my second year. I do robots for, for, for bettering engineering, science, and technology, and for scholarships. While some people may think robotics is only a competition, this homeschool team believes it is much, much more. While we are here building a robot, we're also here trying to form leaders. And we'll spend the whole off season working on each kid individually, trying to get them to that point. So maybe they can graduate, go out into the world, and really be successful. Students building a future for tomorrow, one robot at a time. Now talking to their coach, the Ninja Monkeys are gearing up for another robotics season by taking more AutoCAD, electronics, and metal fabrication classes. Oklahoma Horizon is now portable. Just subscribe to our weekly podcast. Visit iTunes.com where you can download our show for your listening or viewing convenience. Well, while temperatures may be receding just a bit, the summer's drought keeps hanging on and the effects may last even longer. 
Joining me now is our Keila Kellen. Well, Rob, according to the USDA, you'd have to go all the way back to the days of the Dust Bowl to find drought conditions as widespread as we have this year. Especially hard hit are farmers in the Midwest Corn Belt states, an impact that the rest of us may soon feel. With temperatures reaching record highs and drought sweeping the nation, prices in our supermarkets may begin to rise. This is the nation's worst agricultural drought since 1988. Brad Rippey, a meteorologist for the USDA, points out how the drought is affecting our nation. A lot of the nation's key agriculture areas. Now this is especially hitting the nation's farm belt hard and if you look at the overall drought coverage for the lower 48 states, we see now more than half of the country in drought. But if you focus specifically on the U.S. corn and soybeans, more than three quarters are now considered to be in an area covered by drought. So the real focus has been across the Central Plains and the Midwest. And hardest hit is our nation's Corn Belt. USDA Chief Economist Joe Glubber says that corn supply could fall next year to its lowest in nearly 20 years. 35% of the soybean crop, 45% of the corn crop rated poor or very poor. We've seen a rapid deterioration over really three or four short weeks, uh, such that we're uh, in, at least the, the crop is in similar condition to what it was in 1988. So with a smaller crop and prices rising, farmers will face a higher feed cost, forcing some farmers to head to the cell barn. As herd sizes cut back, as flocks, um, you know, uh, are, are cut, those, you begin to see higher prices in, in the meat and poultry and dairy sectors. And that, that ultimately will be, you know, uh, that can take some time to, to really show up in inflation. Ricky Volpe says that we can expect store prices to rise. The most important mechanism by, way, by which this drought is affecting food prices is we see the price of corn go up, that drives up the price of feed, and in turn the price of animals that go to slaughter or animal products. We're looking at grocery prices to go up 3 to 4 percent, which is a range that does not include historically normal food price inflation, which is about 2.8, 2.9 percent. So mostly owing to this drought, how we have seen it affect crop prices, how we expect it to be filtered into retail food prices, we are looking at 2013 being a year of higher than normal food price inflation. A struggle for America's farmer that will soon be felt in all of our pocketbooks. Obama visited the Midwest, announcing the USDA is working to offset the debt caused by the drought by purchasing $100 million worth of pork products, $50 million worth of chicken, and $20 million worth of lamb and farm-raised catfish to help livestock producers. So while this may well help the producers, this is really going to solve the problem. Well, Rob, Obama did humorously say that we can't make it rain, but this could help farm families. But for the rest of us, this could mean higher prices in the grocery store. So it sounds like we better get out the pocketbook. All right, thank you so much, Kayla. You're welcome. Well, while this year's drought is the worst to hit the nation in over a half a century, here in Oklahoma, while it has been bad, our drought conditions actually have been worse. OETA's Kathy Tatum explains. Fluffy white clouds float over Jonathan Scheffel's Mays County farm. For a long time, clouds haven't brought what his land needs most. It just seems like we can't get a rain. It just splits and goes around us every time it gets close. Here, like much of Oklahoma, pastures are bone dry. It just crumbles under your feet. Oklahoma Agriculture Secretary Jim Reese says a lack of rain is affecting some, but not all, crops. We are in a drought. We have a lot of areas that are in extreme drought, but in comparison to last year, it really doesn't compare. The, uh, you know, last year we clearly had the hottest uh, summer in the history of any state in America and the, hot, and the driest uh, summer of any state in America. So to compare that with, with this year, it's, it's really not comparable. The drought of 2011 started in the fall of 2010 and didn't let up in most parts of the state until early 2012. It devastated two of Oklahoma's major agricultural industries, cattle and wheat. This year, drought didn't set in until early May, sparing the wheat. 
Wheat crop was excellent this year, the best wheat I've ever raised in my life. We had 60, 70, and I heard of 80 bushel wheat. Never heard of that in Mays County. And uh, basically, I think because of the dry winter that we had. But this year, drought is once again taking a heavy toll on cattle. Sheffel's pastures are so dry, he's already feeding hay. Right now, these cows here are, are eating a bale a day. In 2011, drought conditions were so severe, many areas of the state had no hay crop at all. Sheffel's grateful he was able to bale some hay this year, but he's worried about using it this early. We've got enough hay to make it through the winter, but if, if we could wait till winter to start, but starting feeding now, we're gonna be in trouble. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we take a look at a bright spot in the U.S. economy, and that's our exports. Exports are a very important part of our economy, mostly because they help generate wealth. The products and the goods that we sell to people outside of the state of Oklahoma bring in money to Oklahoma. Plus, we'll look at how America has gotten spoiled on oil. On the Bush Over the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, we are out of time. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.